Hello, everybody. Um, I am April Borkman with the Empower Program, and uh, I am here today talking with Dr. Liz Wallace about STIs and HIV and how they affect young people, including teens. Um, so, Dr. Wallace, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us um, about where you work. Sure. So I'm a pediatrician by training, but I'm what's called an adolescent medicine specialist. So I see primarily teenage patients and young adults with all kinds of issues from primary care issues to STIs to mental health issues to eating disorders. Um, and I work at a university in Charleston, South Carolina. Very good. So, um, so you already told us what type of doctor you are, but what's the average range of your patients, like age range? So on average, an adolescent medicine doctor sees patients from maybe 11 and up, 11 or 12, um, through early adulthood. So I see patients as old as 23, 24, before they transition to an adult, a, a doctor who specializes in taking care of adults. Got it. So you see a lot of teens, and that's our mm -hmm. primary uh, target, teens and young people. So you see all the way up to almost age 25. Um, so tell us, um, what you, do you think that STIs and HIV should be a concern for young people um, and your patients? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, any teenager who is thinking about being sexually active or is sexually active should definitely be thinking about STDs and what their risk is. Um, and how to protect themselves as best they can. I think it's also really important for teenagers, you know, some of their biggest influence are their peers. So they also have the opportunity, even if they themselves are not sexually active, of, you know, being able to, to counsel their peers or their friends about STIs and their risk. But it's definitely something teenagers should be thinking about. Yeah, great. Yeah, we you kind of leaned on something that we always talk about too about, you know, even if you're not when we're talking to our youth out in the community that even if you're not sexually active, um, you probably know somebody who is and they could really benefit from the knowledge that you're getting right now. Right. Um, so we call that like peer education, near peer um, kind of approach. So we, we think we know that teens should be concerned. Do you think that some of the teens that you have in your practice are actually concerned when they come into you? So I definitely have teenagers who come in and they're concerned, either because, you know, they just happen to be concerned about it because they know the risk or because they're having symptoms of an STI. Um, and so, but then I have a lot of teenagers who maybe not, don't realize that they should be worried um, about their risk of STIs. Right, because one of, and one of the things that we always talk about um, with our teens is that a lot of times you can, there are no symptoms, right? Right. So if you are sexually active and you're not, especially if you're sexually active and not using any form of um, protection, then you should be going in to see a doctor like yourself to um, be tested <clears throat> and to talk about your risks. Right. I have a lot of teenagers who will say to me like, no, like my partner, he doesn't have anything. He doesn't look like he has anything. And I'll sometimes say to them, do you have some magic power that I don't? Because you can't look at, you can't tell by looking at somebody whether or not they have an STI. Right. They might or seem he, like the nicest person and the most honest, but you know, they could still be at risk for an STI. Right. You really don't know for sure until you have that like piece of paper that has your test results on it. Right. Like exactly. And negative. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, so tell us about HIV. Um, is it, it's now considered more of a chronic illness um, mm -hmm. rather than a terminal illness, which is wonderful news. Um, you know, there used to be a time where it was considered, you know, something that if you got it, you were going to die from that. Um, right. We're now in a, a place where there's lots of treatment options and medications and preventative things. Um, but do you still think that youth should be concerned with it? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So you know, you make a great point that HIV is much more treatable than it used to be, but it's still a chronic disease and it's still a chronic disease that you don't want. Um, it has, you know, the medications have a lot of complications and side effects. It's still a, a lifetime illness. Um, and again, we know it's sexually transmitted in the same way that other STIs are sexually transmitted. We also know that STIs tend to travel together. So if you have HIV, you may be at higher risk of contracting something like chlamydia and vice versa. If you have chlamydia or gonorrhea, you may be at higher risk for transmitting, for contracting HIV from a partner. Um, mm -hmm. 
Can you and, talk a little bit about why that is? I mean, obviously, if you're having unprotected sex, you're at risk for both. But is there something um, inside your body that's causing that that is associated with that? And can you talk so, a little bit about it? Yeah, there's definitely, we think probably that the the tissue and the area where you would get infected is maybe not as um, robust when you have a concurrent infection or a second infection. So you're at risk, you know, for basically catching whatever comes your way. Mm -hmm. um, some of these factors aren't as, in, as clear, but, but we definitely know that like the mucosa or the layers of the vagina or the penis, um, that those are... Um, you know, not as robust when you, when you have a concurrent STI is probably the best way to explain it. Right. And, and HIV affects your immune system too, right? So it knocks, Absolutely. if you're contracting HIV, it's knocking your immune system back for a period of time, at least until you get tested and know you have it or are medicated. And so you're very, very vulnerable during that time period, right? For Absolutely. Any, for anything, yeah. Um, yeah. whether it's a cold or something else. So it, STI is certainly going to be um, Absolutely. a concern. Yeah. Um, so do you think that teens who come to you who are sexually active, so let's say a teen walks in and says, I'm sexually active, um, generally speaking, because I know you're going to have some teens who are and some teens who aren't, but do you think they truly understand their risks for HIV and STIs and unplanned pregnancy um, mm -hmm. when they come into your office and tell you they're sexually active? It's, so like you said, there's a huge variability, mm -hmm. right? So I see some teenagers who have been fortunate, have had really good education about STIs, either from their family or their friends or a program like Empower or their school, and they really do understand how to have sex safely. I think it's really hard for all teenagers to truly understand their risk, mm -hmm. um, just because you know we know teenage brains aren't fully developed, and so they don't think so much about if this happens, then five years down the road, this might be the consequence. It's just not the way the teenage brain thinks. The teenage brain thinks more about the immediate consequence. Yeah. Um, you know, Some adults do, too, though, right? Yeah, exactly. I know, yes, <laughs> totally true. A lot of adults think that way as well. So, I mean, I think that there are some teens who come in with a lot of information and are pretty um, empowered to know what they need to ask for and ask for testing and things like that. But I see a lot of teenagers who just haven't had as much education or opportunity to learn this information. And so they go into it really, really quite blindly and, and at a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. You know, they so, have a partner who says, maybe don't wear a condom or, you know, I don't like to wear a condom or, you know, and they haven't necessarily learned how to find their voice. To right. Make that happen. Right. And that's one of the things we talk about in our programs too. We talk about two things you touched on, understanding, how decisions that you are making now can affect your future goals and dreams and how, you know, getting pregnant before you're ready can affect whether or not you finish high school or college when you want to, um, et, et cetera. And we, um, and we also talk to them a bit about what we call negotiation skills or learning how to be uh, assertive in communication rather than passive, um, which I think we, we have a lot of teens who are just, if they have an older partner, are going to trust what their older partner says, right? right. Um, but you can't really do that. Um, you have to kind of watch out for yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, you have to be the best advocate for your body and your health. Right. And nobody's going to do that more than you. Exactly, exactly. And we, we try to empower them, pardon the pun, um, but we do try to empower them to do that. Um, all right, so in your capacity as a doctor, what would you tell a teen who is sexually active? Like, what's the, the sort of elevator speech, the like five minute, okay, you're sexually active, here's what um, you need to be thinking about? Yeah, so I think the average teenager, um, it's contraception and STI prevention. And it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. Um, you know, from a contraception perspective, yes, girls who are having sex with guys, that's the most important group who needs to know about contraception or something to prevent pregnancy. But guys need to know if they're having sex with girls, what their partner's using. They are just as responsible for saying, hey, are you on something? Because it takes two to make a baby. Um, and that's a lifetime responsibility. So I think the first thing is understanding what's your risk of pregnancy um, and what are you doing about contraception? And then the second piece, which is just as important, which is what's your risk for STIs and what are you doing to protect yourself? Have you and your partner been tested? Are you and your partner using condoms or you know, equivalent devices, depending on what type of partner you have? Um, 
you know, really those are probably the two big areas that I cover. And then the third is really, is this something that you feel comfortable with and you want to do? Um, yeah, you know, very good. Very consent good is really something that's really important. And so understanding, um, especially some of my younger teenagers, I want to understand, are they feeling pressured to do something that they don't feel ready to do? And if so, how do I help them walk through that? Yeah, right. That's, I'm really glad you brought that up. And cause we, we also should talk about, you know, consent with teens as well. Like this is what consent actually looks like. And we're actually doing a, um, a panel discussion today. We're going to touch a little bit on consent um, because I, I think a lot of teens need that education as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, and I think that um, I've heard all kinds of things from teenagers arguments as to why, you know, well, I have to do this because X or, you know, he did this. So I have to, you know, or she did this. So I have to, the truth is none of that is true. Um, you got to feel comfortable with the decision that you're making about your body and nobody should force you or make you feel pressured into doing that. Right. And if you feel that way, please, please, please go find a trusted adult or family member or teacher or somebody in your life um, mm -hmm. to talk to you about that because we want to make sure that you're being safe. Um, Absolutely because there's a lot of things associated. If you're being forced to do something you don't want to do sexually, you could be being forced to do things you don't want to do in other areas as well. So any teen who's watching right now, if, if that's the case, please find someone to talk to about it so they can help you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to circle back to just kind of talking about teens who might come into um, your office for services. Um, what are the rules laws pertaining to minors who, who come in and want to access birth control or STI testing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that for teens who might be watching who don't know if, do they have to have parents permission? Can they come in on their own? So yeah, so the South Carolina laws are that teenagers um, who are 16 or are mature minors, and that's not really defined what a mature minor is, um, have the right to have access to confidential STI testing treatment contraception without their parents knowledge um, you know it becomes a little bit more complicated if you're on your parents insurance right because even if you come into my office or into a you know a doctor's office and you want to have testing sometimes you have to make sure what kind of insurance you have to know whether those results or that information might get back to your parents mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of folks will use the health department um, and places like that where they can really get confidential testing and treatment. Um, and if they're 16 or up, they can do that. The federal law is actually 14 and up. Um, and so, but the state laws vary between different states. So you have to know a little bit about what's, what's the law in your specific state. So the state law trumps the federal law in that case. So that's a good, that's a great question that a lot of attorneys, I think, have spent some time trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> so, so, but not I guess for sure, sixteen or mature minor. Um, and I think if somebody under sixteen is not sure, you know, it's a great way to ask your doctor and say, "Hey, there's something I really want to talk to you about, but um, it's not something I've talked to my parents about." You know, and what I say to teenagers is, I say, "Well, I can, you know, I can provide. I can never guarantee confidentiality if I'm worried about your safety." So if I'm worried about something, that you're doing something, you're in danger, um, or somebody's hurting you, I would have to break confidentiality. But most pediatricians and young adult doctors will be willing to talk to teens confidentially and help them kind of navigate this process because they want them to be safe as well. Right, right. Very good. Good. I hope that helps some folks watching um, and encourages them to actually go in. I think that's a fear that a lot of teens have. Uh, is that they'll get to a doctor and they won't be able to get the treatment or they'll have to get their parents permission and they don't want to have to deal with that. So um, hopefully that's cleared up a little bit of yeah. a lot of and misconception, I, I think, too. Yeah. I think you just have to think about depending on what you need, right? Um, if you need a birth control prescription that you have to get once a month, you just have to make sure you can get to the pharmacy and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, if you choose something longer acting, you may not have to, you may just need to go for that one visit. So yeah. just kind of, but someone can help you think through those things to try to keep it as confidential as possible. Right. And I should uh, also hope you don't mind me plugging this, but the local um, health departments often will yeah. um, give birth control pills um, in large quantities, right? So yes, they'll often absolutely. distribute to a person, any person, 
young person or not, who goes in for birth control, if they're prescribed um, pills, they'll give them, you know, 12 months worth of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. So what would you advise parents to do if they suspect that their teen is sexually active? It's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> um, it's really tough. I mean, I think that um, talk to your teenager. So, you know, we do know there's good data to say that teens who have access to contraception and comprehensive family planning services are not more likely to have sex, but they are more likely to have safe sex. Um, and so one thing I would say for parents is, you know, giving your kids or promoting your kids having access to a confidential provider or talking about birth control, talking about STI prevention, you are not increasing the likelihood that your kid is going to have sex. You're increasing the likelihood that if they have sex, they have sex safely. Um, I think as a parent, it is really important to talk to your kids about what your value system is. Um, and what is important to your family and your, you know, religious community or your, you know, family's um, heritage, whatever it is, and, and how it pertains to sex. But at the same time, I think trying to come at that with a really open minded, um, not from a place of anger or frustration or, you know, as, as open minded as you can be in talking with teens, I think you'll get a lot more out of the conversation. Yeah, right. Right. And um, not in a punishing way. Like if you do right. this, this will happen to you. You will be disowned. You will, you know, right. whatever it might be to say, you know, in our family, uh, in our culture and our religious uh, practice, this is what we, we want for people. And this is what we want for young people. And this is why we want you to be healthy. We want you to have a, you know, filling life, whatever the reasons are. Um, and like you said, in sort of a, a, a non judgmental way. Right. And I think, again, coming at it, too, from a, you know, help me understand, um, you know, was this something that you, you decided, did you feel, co again, did you feel coerced? Do you feel comfortable with this? You know, are you doing the things that if this is going to be the decision that you make, are you, are you, you know, being smart about it? Are you protecting yourself and protecting your partner? Because that is your responsibility when you become sexually active is to protect yourself. Um, from sexually transmitted infections and, and pregnancy and everything else. Great. Thank you. Um, hopefully there's some, there. I'm sure that there's some parents watching who that will be very helpful for them to hear that. Um, all right. So last question, what would you advise other clinicians or doctors to do when it comes to addressing sexual activity and risk for STIs and HIV and unplanned pregnancy? Because not all doctors are created equal, right? They're not all uh, accepting and understanding of, of teens having sex, right? When they come into right. their office and ask them questions. So what would you um, advise a clinician or a doctor to, to do? I think the first thing I would say, and some of this is true for parents too, is check your bias and what that is. So understand, you know, what you want for your child or what your view is on sex, you know, at a young age or whatever it is, check your bias at the door because what's right for you or your family may not be what's true or how you were raised may not be right. What's right for this teenager. And your job is to provide this teenager good comprehensive health care. Um, it's not to shame them or lecture them. Um, and then I think going in with an open mind, um, you also have to get comfortable saying the words and talking about the topic. So there's a lot of people, there's a lot of doctors who get, especially pediatricians, because we're used to seeing little kids and talking about development and, you know, um, runny noses and strep throat and things like that, that they can get a little bit uncomfortable talking about these things. And so it's really important to practice so that you feel comfortable with the words because teenagers are smart. They will see right through. If you are like awkward and embarrassed, you will not get the information that you need. Um, and you won't, the teen won't have an opportunity to really have a frank conversation about their health care. So I think, you know, yeah. Check your bias, be open-minded, be comfortable with the topic are probably the three big things. Great. Wonderful. This has been um, a great conversation. Um, and thank you for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Oh, um, and I hope, yeah, I hope that some folks who are watching will get a lot out of this and, um, you know, stay tuned to our social media. If you're on there, we're on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Um, sometimes we're on TikTok as well, although we're trying to figure it out. Um, and so you guys just pay, you know, look for more videos and more discussions. So thank you, Dr. Wallace. Thanks so much for having me.